So, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present what we are doing at Slocket. So for those of you who maybe don't know me, I have been working for Ethereum since summer 2014 as a lead tester, actually together with Gavin, um, working also on the C++ client for a while. Then created Slocket, was very involved in the DAO, long story. And now we are working on something we call Incubed in the Slocket IoT Oops, lock it IoT layer. Sorry. And I want to talk to you a bit more about this. So first, a non-technical introduction, and then we'll get into the tech more technical part. So why are we doing this? So when I thought, what is what, are, what is useful with Ethereum? What, is, what can Ethereum be used for? This was end of 2015. I was not really believing in that this will become a mainstream currency or be used as such. But for devices, um, such as IoT devices, this is an ideal backbone of providing a secure infrastructure for them to not only exchange value, but also enter into complex agreements, and most importantly, doing permission management. Because if you look at smart contracts, I think 99% of them are just managing permissions some way. Um, so this revolution of connecting humans and IoT devices, that's the underlying motivation, so to say. There are billions of smartphones, IoT devices, but also billions of machine-to-machine -machine connections. So this is the thing we are targeting. I don't need to tell you about all the different kinds of IoT devices you see around. Um, but today when we speak of IoT device, it's more or less everything which is connected to the internet, which is even my smartphone, maybe my car, um, and of course those smaller microcontrollers. So that we, we define three types of interactions. The first one is the human to machine. And that's what we first tackled. And actually, if you go to the App Store, you can download our Slocket app. And what you can do there is connect IoT devices to a smart contract on chain and let other people pay in order to use them. So for example, you can have a smart door lock connected through the app and people can pay in order to open the door. Or we have, have even with me one of those locks from second. Something like this, that's a little Bluetooth smart lock. So you can actually connect it with the app and people pay to open it. And you could have a bike or something else behind it. So this is already working. This is this human to machine access. You pay a machine to give you access. The second one is the machine to machine connection. So you could think of a car paying a charging station. Some are familiar with the project Chair and Charge. So something we have been very involved in or have built the backbone that you have charging stations connected to a smart contract, so you have cars connected to it, and they can pay each other. You can even think about parking slots, toll collections, and other things. So this is coming. I would say this is short-term, mid-term, long-term. If you go to long-term, the machine to human, um, this is something like if a car needs to change its tires, an, an autonomous car is driving into the garage and paying the people there to fix it. Yeah. Then we had, for example, one request from a company um, who cleans houses and said, why cannot be the cleaning staff be paid by the smart lock after they clean the apartment? Because sometimes they don't show up and they have several problems. So actually the machine, or in this case the lock or the, the car, could pay humans to do certain services for them. And for all those use cases, we need a secure infrastructure. Currently machines don't have wallets. There is no insecure interoperability and our high security risk. Often if you create an IoT system, you have to choose between two things. Either it's secure, you lock, you close everything down, you don't connect to anything, or it's highly interoperable. You connect to third party IoT clouds, IFTTT, and all those kind of things, then you're vulnerable to many attacks. And we found this with a lot of those smart locks actually are not very secure. So if we work with them or they integrate their services, technically they are giving us the key to from their users. So we can just give it to someone else. So this interoperability and security are usually the problem to have both. And that's what we want to achieve. So blockchain can solve a lot of those things. Can give wallets to machines, you get a distributed standard, um, you get security and transparency. But what's the biggest problem right now? How do you connect those IoT devices to the blockchain? So people, of course, you never ever think about a full client or even a pruned full client. It's way too much storage, way too much bandwidth, way too much computation to even think of. So when we designed the um, Ethereum protocol, we made it very light client friendly by making it possible to create Merkle proofs, to have logs and events and all those kind of things. So people thought, well, light clients, they are the solution for IoT devices. 
but I can tell you they are not. And I don't believe that light clients will be the future of IoT devices. And the reason for this is not storage, although 50 megabytes is a lot, it's also not computation, it's bandwidth. So we did a feasibility study with a German car manufacturer about putting light clients in their cars, and the main problem by far was the bandwidth requirements. Basically because those clients are part of the peer-to-peer -peer network. They're sending around transactions, they're sending around blocks, and they're always active. And if you have been inactive for a couple of weeks and you become active again, it takes you minutes or even tens of seconds, which is, way, which is way too much for normal users until you're synchronized and all of those kind of things. So bandwidth was actually the biggest problem. So what people sometimes then do is they just use a remote client. So <coughs> why not say, let's use Infura or some similar services. Well, but then the, a lot of the benefits are just gone away. You, don't, you have a single point of failure and have a lot of those problems. So we thought about what can we do to get a similar user experience or developer experience such as remote client, but still have the decentralization and this secure backbone which you want to achieve. And that's something we have developed which we call Incubed. And I want to describe now to you in the next well, 15 minutes or so how Incubed actually works. So Incubed stands for a trustless incentivized remote node network. Some people call it decentralized and fora, but I think I like to more call it a minimal verification client. And I will come to this um, topic why I like to call it like this. So in this incubed network, you have nodes. You could even say servers. What they do, so they usually are full nodes running on some kind of powerful server system, highly connected to the internet. And they offer an RPC interface and they pay or offer a security deposit when they register. They have the task to provide information and to validate it. So what do these nodes do? We have a smart contract, which is a registry. They register as being a node and pay a deposit. And then they can answer requests. As a client, so something which goes into IoT devices, you can, when you bootstrap those IoT devices, they need to be bootstrapped with the current list in the registry. After this, they can get, their, can, can get updates on their own. So what is the client doing? The incubed client is completely stateless. Means it needs to store nothing but the code itself. Doesn't store block headers, doesn't store transactions, doesn't store anything but the code itself. So minimal storage requir requirements. It can do RPC calls to those nodes. And now comes the important point. They can independently verify the correctness. That's why I like to call them minimal verification client. I would not even say that it's a client in the sense of light clients and pruned nodes and all of this. They are just verifying. That's all they do. And they can su support multiple chains at the same time. I'll come to this how this works exactly. So now, how does it work? You have the incubed client sending an RPC request to one of those nodes, saying I need to have some, some information from this chains. Gets a response, which is a Merkle proof and a block header. That's usually what light clients do. Light clients get Merkle proofs and block headers. But what they need to know is, is the block header correct? That's the question here. And now this is the, the important part. When the incubed client gives the request to some node, it will choose some other nodes here, A and C, and the client is choosing those nodes to sign a block hash. So then node B will ask A and C, and the reason why it's not asking directly is just for bandwidth reason, um, that A and C are asked, and they sign a block hash, and node B gives those signed block hashes um, back in the response. So what does the client have now? They have the Merkle proof based on a block header, and they have the hash of the block header signed by two nodes they asked for. And they can choose them randomly, they can ask for two, they can ask for five or 10, whatever they want. The important part is, if they lie, they lose their deposit, if they sign a wrong block hash. But they need to be checked. And those are, we call them watchdogs, but actually node B is checking them. Node C could even check the response from node B and so on. They can um, check each other if they sign the right block hash. And now there comes the magic now. The Ethereum virtual machine, when you write a smart contract, there's only one opcode which gives you information from the past. The only one is called the block hash opcode. Everything else is what's the current state, what's the current storage, what's the current balance, what's happening currently. But block hash, you can ask for the block hash of the last 256 blocks. 
which is roughly about one hour. Meaning, in the smart contract itself, they can be convicted because you can retrieve the block hash in the smart contract. So when they have paid the deposit in the beginning, you node know, A, B, and C, to be servers in the enqubed system, someone else can say, if I find you having, you having signed a wrong block hash, I can take this to the smart contract and convict you and get your deposit. This makes it secure. This is just this one function in the smart contract called convict. They say which server, block hash, block number, and the signature. And here you check if the block hash is not equal to what the EVM gives you here. Um, by retrieving it directly in from the opcode, then you check with easy recover if, it, if, if this is the owner. If yes, we only actually pay 50% of the deposit to the one who convict the server and the other one is just burned. The reason is because the server can just convict itself. It could lie and then sign a wrong block hash and get the deposit back. So that's why you need to burn it. So, but sometimes maybe the one who found it out is faster than the server, so you should still give him some money. So that's why 50% is burned, 50% um, is given to the one, and maybe those numbers will change in the future. So that's the important part of why we can do all of this completely decentralized. Okay, this is the first part. So now if a, serv a network of nodes or servers who have paid a deposit, which will be slashed if they lie, and they just give Merkle proofs, signed block caches to those clients, which they can verify. Of course, they want to have some payment. So we also uh, introduced the micropayment from the enqubed client to those nodes for signing block caches. Because those servers or nodes signing block caches, they actually take a risk because they may be wrong. And so in the beginning we used state channels. Currently we are working on a, an a adopted variant of something called probabilistic micropayment, which was I first read about it from Gustav Siemensen. So I don't have time to talk about this now, but um, I think you have heard a lot about state channels or probabilistic micropayments, how you can do the payments from the client um, to those nodes. So actually everybody running a full node can become an enqubed node and earn some money by serving some information to, um, like to, to IoT devices. And actually it doesn't all need to be IoT devices. I think not many people are actually running their own node on even their laptop because it takes too much time, <coughs> energy or storage so they just connect to Infora or something. So even for them, it makes sense to install an enqubed client. Another, another nice feature of this system is um, it doesn't really matter which blockchain you're talking to. Since you're not part of this peer-to-peer -peer network, you're not even synchronizing to this chain. You can talk at the same time to, let's say, the Ethereum main chain, or you're working for also the Energy Web Foundation, the Tobaloba chain, um, or whatever, or Polkadot, or whatever you want to. Because you're stateless, you don't store anything, you don't, you're not synchronized, you're not connected to a P2B network. You just verify responses. So as long as you have one node you can connect to from this chain, and you have the server or the registry, which are the servers there, you can connect to it, talk to it, verify responses. So but with this, you get one, we could call it just blockchain client, which can simultaneously connect to all the chains. And it's really, really light doesn't need much, uh, does have a very low hardware requirements. And you can even think about integrating I IPFS or other things. Because I think in the end, normal users will not run those heavy blockchain nodes. They usually want just verification. So you verify responses. And that's what this minimal verification client or the enqubed client is actually doing. So this is what enqubed is about. The slog at IoT layer is something bigger, but I don't have yeah, the time today to go into details. But what we want to provide is a you could say SDK or toolbox for developers to build IoT applications on top of blockchains without understanding all the details, adding a layer of abstraction, you could say. And in this IoT layer, you get this enqubed client, have a micropayment solution, um, payments we have, for example, integrated with Stripe. <coughs> you can also do fiat payments, of course, then you need to depend on them. But you can support all the ESA, ERC20 tokens, Bitcoin, and so on. We have access control smart contracts, which we found out to be the most important feature for IoT systems. That what currently IoT clouds are doing are two things. They're managing access and do analysis of data. And the first one, managing access to devices, that can be done perfectly by smart contracts. We have a discovery service, which is something like a telephone book for IoT devices where they can offer their services. Messaging, they're actually using matrix. Uh, Multi-chain support. Um, IoT cloud integrations with IFTTT, Samsung Arctic Cloud, and many others, where you can, devices which are already controlled through a cloud can also connect to the system and then control them through a smart contract. 
And we have some IoT integration, meaning we are supporting a lot of common SOC boards that you can just deploy the software. So if you ask about where, do, where does it all fit in in this ecosystem, well, if you think about Ethereum or Polkadot and other as a blockchain layer, then there is a socket IoT layer in between if you build something which needs those tools and you have the application layer on top. That's where we sit. Important is, here's some features of the system. Well, we are highly interoperable because, first of all, a smart contract for IoT device is something like a direct or open API to this device. So you can then build systems that use all of this. And we can use all of those chains. We are not committed to one chain only. You get the security of the chain. You have no single point of failure, no, lo no login because you just need your keys, full payment support, permission management, <coughs> something very important, app coin free, meaning we don't have a slocker token or anything. Um, this makes us free to act on any chain. So this makes us makes the product actually also much more attractive for lo even large corporations or others who don't want to go to the due diligence of checking your token, what it is, um, and having to buy your token in order to use your product. So this is actually much easier. Okay. And I want to give you some idea on what kind, what the hardware requirements are for running an Incube client. In the beginning, we started with Raspberry Pis, then we moved to Samsung Artix, and now we're actually using a very, very small device from Nordic Semiconductors, and this can actually run the Incube client. We just tried it out yesterday, actually, and controlled the door lock with it. Actually, a small lock. So since it's stateless, it doesn't really store anything except the code itself. Um, it's decentralized and secure, and you have incentivization to micropayments. So I wanted to show you this um, controller where it's running on, if you can see it, because it's actually very small. Just give me one second. I can find it. So. So this is this microcontroller here. I don't know if you can see it at all. This is a microcontroller where an Incube client can run on. And as far as I know, this is the smallest device ever to run a client for Ethereum, for example. And if many people speak about IoT, they only, only put private keys on an IoT device. This is nice. You, it allows you to write, but it doesn't allow you even to verify if a transaction went through, because this is a read operation. And actually, for blockchain, it's much easier to write than to read, because reading means verifying. So here's the same chip. So it has a Cortex processor of 32-bit, running at 64 megahertz, only one megabyte of flash, and 256 kilobyte of RAM. So this is completely enough to connect to a blockchain, to verify its responses, and to many at the same time. And this opens up what I say scaling access, because now you can actually connect much more devices to a blockchain than before. And this is even very um, usable on a mobile or on a laptop because it doesn't need much um, resources and you can, you're always basically connected to all those chains, just verifying. Okay, I think with this, I want to open up last four or five minutes to questions. So do you have any questions to those solutions? Yeah, that's, that's the most important question. I hope I try to explain this here. So a like client, they just synchronize block headers to know what is the latest block header. And the rest is just a Myrtle proof. Here you do the same, but you don't, you're not part of the P2P network, so you're not synchronizing block headers. Where do you get it from? When you're asking here your node, you ask, you're choosing some nodes, here we call them A and C, could be five, could be 10, and you are choosing them, to sign the current block hash. They just sign it. So I did the hash, 
I, be, I believe it to be the true one. You can you can choose who it is, and they give you this response. And now, why do you trust this signed block hash? Because those nodes have paid a deposit, and you can read how high this deposit is. And in the case they lie, you can just publish basically those signed block hashes. Or also, node B is checking them. Everybody can call this convict function and get a deposit. So the security you have is just this. This is the amount of deposit those people have paid who, who have given me a signed block hash. Could be one dollar, could be thousand, or one million. And that's exactly the amount of security you have for having a correct response. So, and I also think that people having paid a higher deposit will charge you more for giving you the signed block hash. So you basically can choose how secure is your response in terms of money. If wrong block hash? How do you define it? Well, if it doesn't ma on this chain where this contract is deployed, if it doesn't match with what the EVM gives you for the block hash for this block number, it's very easy to define. So, well, let's say the public Ethereum chain, for example, in this smart contract, each past block, the last 256 blocks, have a defined block hash. So, if someone says, I signed block 5,100,000 something, and I think this is the block hash, and if this is wrong, then you go here, and as the argument, you give the block hash, the block number, and the signature. And if this is not correct, you can get a deposit. Usually they are doing like ease call, asking for some information in a smart contract or something. They just they can do exactly the same as a like client is doing, but just instead of verifying all the block headers and res resolving what is the current block hash, they trust those people who have paid a deposit to giving you the right block hash. And in the case they give you a wrong one, you can convict them and get their money. So that's your security model is how much deposit is behind those signed block hashes. And you know exactly how much deposit is behind there. So if you have something like, let's say you have this bike locked with this thing, you don't need more than, let's say, $500 as a security deposit because it's a bi the bike is not worth more. So you only pay for signed block hashes, block hashes with a deposit of around $500. But let's say you have millions of dollars behind it. You want to have it signed by someone with a much, much higher deposit or even choosing tens or thousands of servers. You can ask 10 or 20 servers to sign it and add their deposit on top of each other to know how secure the response is. So I think one more question, then we are done. <laughs> yeah. The block only knows that the block hash has been checked by servers I, am, I have chosen. And if wrong, they will get a deposit, so I can trust it to a certain extent. They can even publish a designed block hash to get certain security that people will check it. Technically, yes, of course. No, the only security model you're having is that this protocol is behind it and that it has been checked because you don't ask for the block hash of node B. You're asking for A and C. And B has a very high incentive to check if the block hash is correct or not because if, if it's wrong, they can get a deposit. No, no, no. They are, they are asking node B, but node B doesn't even sign the block hash. They, they are saying, please ask AC for a signature. They sign and node B is checking. And it's just incentive game. Okay, I need, I need to stop. So thank you very much for your attention.